Good evening. I'm David Gray, Dean of the Faculty of Agriculture and the Principal of the Dalhousie Agricultural Campus. I would like to acknowledge that Dalhousie is located in Mi'kmaq Key, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. As a place of learning, we pay respect to the indigenous knowledge held by the Mi'kmaq people and to the wisdom of their elders, past and present. I'm pleased to welcome you to this evening's Open Dialogue Live, taking a bite out of food insecurity. Zero hunger by 2030. That's one of 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals with an aim to end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition by the year 2030, while promoting sustainable agriculture. It's a bold aim, and getting there could prove more challenging after a year like 2020. In the year 2020, 2.37 billion people were without food or unable to eat a healthy, balanced diet on a regular basis. According to the State of Food and Agriculture 2021, COVID-19 pandemic restrictions harmed not only agri-food trade, agri-food supply chains, and agri-food markets, but also people's lives, livelihoods, and nutrition. Tonight's episode, we, we will explore the importance of sustainable and healthy food production systems, the complexity of our food and agricultural industry, and the socioeconomic considerations that contribute to food insecurity and inequity. So it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists this evening. We have uh, Ashley McDonald, um, and Ashley is in her third year of her PhD in Agricultural Sciences program here at Dalhousie's Faculty of Agriculture. Her research area is agricultural business with a particular interest in sustainability, and data-driven decision-making. We also have with us Dr. Paul Manning. Paul is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Agriculture at Dalhousie University. His research aims to better understand the importance of biodiversity, specifically insects, to the health and functioning of agricultural ecosystems. Dr. Peter Tidemers is a professor in the School of Resource and Environmental Studies at Dalhousie University. His research explores understanding and improving the biophysical sustainability of food production systems, seafood production systems in particular. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Gianfranco Mazzanti. And Gianfranco is an associate professor with Dalhousie's Faculty of Engineering. Gianfranco's research centers around crystallization of lipids used in industrial food and cosmetic processing. Welcome to all of you and thank you so much for joining us this evening. So to begin our conversation, um, I'm going to ask a few questions and each of you will be able to weigh in. So the first question I'm going to ask is that there are many factors contributing to today's food security crisis. For example, how is climate change having an impact? Who'd like to have a go first? Perhaps Paul? Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks, thanks, Dr. Gray. And uh, sorry, I just had to pop out for a minute. I had a little bit of a freeze. Um, so I, I, I just heard the second part of that question. Dr. Gray, would you mind repeating it again, please? Of course, Paul. So there are many factors contributing to today's food security crisis. For example, how is climate change having an impact? Perfect, thanks so much. So I'm happy to tackle this from the perspective of an entomologist. And uh, what it's um, really what it comes down to for insects is that they are really closely tied to temperature. So for instance, temperature can limit the population of insects. A cold winter can uh, knock back numbers a lot for the next season. So in that way, uh, having warmer winters can mean more pest insects for the future years, which is tied in really closely to the sufficient amount of food that we need and also a consistent and reliable source of food. So that's um, one of the ways that climate change uh, can intersect with, with that particular part. Um, 
And uh, there's, I mean, there's really all kinds of uh, challenges that we're dealing with with climate change. When even if talking about uh, the unpredictability of uh, fall storms, which can lead to losses like we saw during Hurricane, Hurricane Dorian, uh, as well as uh, losses from early season frost, like we saw with apple blossoms uh, just four years ago. So the ways that it can contribute are, are numerous. Thanks, Paul. Um, Peter, what about you? Excellent. I just wanted to make sure that I'm not muted, and I don't think I am. Um, it's, it's a really important question that we're framing right now in terms of what are sources of food insecurity and how does climate change relate? As Paul was just outlining, climate change is a phenomenon that is going to affect not only the capacity to produce food in certain settings, and Paul was describing some. Over the past year, there's been, um, in the news, a, a drought in Madagascar. Uh, and that has, many people are, are seeing that drought um, as a very clear um, result of changing climate and having a direct result on local food availability in that context. But we have to also keep in mind that most of the current food insecurity on the planet is not a function of limited um, food production. It's a function of insecurity that results from conflict, and it's a function of economic uh, impoverishment. And climate change will contribute to both of those phenomena. It's not just going to affect us on the production side, and that's going to be much more regionalized or localized, but it will inevitably also contribute to the impoverishment of uh, many populations around the world, or the continued struggle to come out of poverty, but also um, result in instability in certain parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter. Um, anyone else like to come in? Gianfranco? Yeah, I always keep thinking of um, when I grew up in Colombia, it seemed that we were always either in a drought or drowning in a flood. And um, there was a constant um, insecurity um, due to these conditions, uh, not that the food was missing for at least those of us who were fortunate enough to go and buy them in the supermarket or in the in the big square market. Um, but a lot of people depended on on crops or their work, and uh, and you, I think of history also, and seems to be same in many places, not only the floods of the Nile, but the floods in China and other places. And humanity has been to, has had to cope with this sort of phenomena. And uh, now we face this kind of the extreme changes that Peter was mentioning. And, uh, and it seems that it's only those who have the means to develop certain technological advantages that can sustain, maintain their food supplies, uh, whereas the rest of a big base population uh, can't. We will develop the technologies as best we can to survive whatever comes. Uh, the question is whether we are going to do that and also provide for all of those who are unfortunate. When I came to Canada, I thought, oh, how fortunate I am now. I live in a society where usually like, you don't kill people in front of me and um, I can find food and there's not a lot of children begging for money in the streets and stuff like that. Over the years, I've realized that no, this is not fortunate. This is normal. What's happening on the other side of the world is what is abnormal, or you can call it unfortunate, although it is, has very little to do with fortune. And uh, I think we need to develop, I you don't know, consciousness, an awareness, um, an empathy. We 
have the resources, technological um, and uh, human, basically, to solve a lot of the problems, I'm sure. And that's what I just want to echo what Peter said, I totally agree, which is the problem is how we change the mentality, how we change the heart, how we change the consciousness. Uh, with an, with an impact that is enough to actually make a change in the sustainability and everything else. That's that's what I, I I would like to see this climate change as another challenge to either get together or uh, deepen the chasm. Okay, thanks, Gianfranco. Um, Ashley, anything to add? Uh, yeah. Um, just to echo kind of the sentiments of of everyone else. Um, I think when we're talking about food security and sort of the effects of climate change and our kind of our overall goal of, of improving food production so that we can feed our growing population, one of the bits that we kind of fail to discuss or fail to consider in, this, in the same vein that um, the others have been speaking of is we are already making enough. <laughs> um, you know, just in Canada alone, an incredibly privileged country. Um, we're wasting 40% of the food that we're producing every year. Um, and at the same time, we have incredibly high rates of food insecurity. So it's it's really not a matter of producing more food. It's a matter of making sure that the food that we're producing is used in an effective way. Because even our food itself, when it is wasted, it's contributing to climate change. It's increasing due to the ineffective use of those resources. And it, um, you know, hopefully not, but oftentimes being placed in landfills with that resource now entirely lost. Great. So, um, and that's, that's a great opener for the conversation because I, I think uh, if nothing else, it's, it's immediately shown just how complicated food security is in some ways. Um, but in other ways, you could look at it and say that food security and food insecurity is actually quite relatively simple. Um, you know, it's, um, uh, but uh, you've got socioeconomics there, you've got, you know, climate issues there. Um, you know, um, Peter touched on a lot of that. And Ashley, you've just explained, you know, that we are producing a significant amount of food and we're wasting a significant amount as well. So, um, and whilst we're at it, I would just, um, I would just uh, say to everyone, you know, that our thoughts are with um, all of our um, colleagues and Canadians out uh, in British Columbia who are dealing with the floods and the, uh, the significant extreme weather and the rains. Um, and I think that's also been a prime example of, of the impact it can have on agriculture, food production, but also supply chains as well. Um, so as we've gone through COVID and, uh, and as, we, as we've, it's gone longer and longer, um, you know, we have seen an increase in food prices. Um, you know, and uh, inflation, when you look at food um, at prices, inflation is, is on the up um, and it is increasing. So when it comes to food price increases of this nature, what are the impacts of these price increases on farmers and producers? Ashley, is this, a, I know that you're, you're into data-driven uh, decision-making. Is, uh, is this an area uh, of interest for you? Uh, it certainly is. And um, so in terms of what the impact of the rising food prices is on farmers and, and primary producers, um, one of the things that I try and visualize is the actual supply chain when we're thinking about that. And within the food supply chain, we have a lot of producers and a lot of consumers, but they're the end bits and we tend to funnel in or bottleneck along our processors and our retailers. And because of that, um, in most situations, not all, but in most, those processors and retailers have the bargaining power when it comes to setting prices. So while the consumers may be experiencing rising prices, it's not necessarily that that rising price is being shared equitably along the supply chain. So to say that rising food prices at the grocery store means that farmers are getting more for their products, we can't say that conclusively. Um, I don't have my, my full number breakdown, but I did a, a cost run not long ago about um, the price of beef. 
and what a beef consumer might or a beef producer might receive for a pound of of meat once it's harvested and it's at at auction it usually a lot like a full carcass weight sells for about 22 cents a pound in, in the last few months um, if we compare that to what we pay at the grocery store for a pound of meat whether it be ground beef or you know some steak that's that's a pretty big shift. Um, of course, there's being there's value added at each stage of the supply chain because there's more resources, time, human capital, or labor being used. But that's just something to keep in mind when we're acting as a consumer to remember that it's that price is being shared along, and the slice of that pie depends really on who has the power in that price setting. Thanks, Ashley. Um, Peter. Um, just to build off of what Ashley was saying, you know, inflation really isn't a product of one sector or another saying it's time for us to raise prices. So, you know, food price increase, as Ashley was outlining so nicely, isn't a function of farmers saying suddenly, all right, it's been hard for how many years we're now going to charge more. It's a product of a lot of um, different parts of society all expecting to be paid better. So we're seeing pressure, upward pressure on wages, which is long overdue across society. Um, you know, as we're bouncing back out of the pandemic, um, a lot of people are not happy about going back to their original jobs under original conditions. So we're seeing upward pressure on, on wage rates. We're seeing uh, central banks think about increasing lending rates, which are then putting upward pressure on mortgages, which is putting upward pressure on consumers. So there's a lot of sources of upward pressure, which individuals experience when they're in a, when, in a grocery store, but it's not um, being driven by who made the food. Or yep. it's not, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and people often forget that, you know, farmers are dealing with increased, uh, you've identified it perfectly, Peter, you know, they're, they're, in, they're dealing with increased costs of fuel, um, feed, um, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, and um, Ashley <laughs> identified that, you know, it's the whole supply chain, you know, it's not the farmer or the producer putting the price up, it's, it's all the way along. Um, and, and COVID, of course, has um, brought with it some significant transport issues, um, you know, and therefore transport costs have gone up as well. So, um, yeah, um, either of our other two panelists uh, like to contribute to this one? If not, we can move on. Paul? No, you good? Okay. Right. So, um, this is a, a follow on from that, really. So um, and this goes back to what Peter was saying earlier about, you know, food and food security and really what's driving food security globally. So is there a clear connection between higher food prices and the rise of poverty? So perhaps Peter can start that one. In some ways, it's a it's a chicken and egg. Um, I think a rise of poverty doesn't necessarily drive higher food prices, but it certainly exacerbates food insecurity. Um, you know, unlike, you know, food insecurity discussions of the 1970s, of, of an earlier generation where it really was much more a supply side set of challenges. As we've already talked about, it is for most people around the world, with some exceptions to about Madagascar and some other locations, um, and most of our food insecurity in Canada, this is entirely a function of poverty or relative poverty, and higher food prices, along with higher fuel costs, along with higher clothing costs um, across the board, because inflation doesn't select one sector to affect. It, is, it, it affects across the board, David, as we were saying earlier, right? I mean, fuel price increases not only affect farmers, but they affect everybody else. Yep. So all of that is, and if you don't have if you have a fixed wage or if you've lost your job or your wage increase is not keeping up with inflation, then you are going to find it harder to um, secure adequate nutrition. So yeah, rising food prices along with rising all prices is, are make, is going to make food insecure people more insecure. 
Thanks, Peter. Yeah, and you touched on another thing, which you know, um, I'm I'm always a little bit surprised um, that when I talk to people, um, they think that food security is not our problem. It's it's not a Canadian problem. It's uh, you know it's a an African problem and an Indian problem and you know but um, it. it it's everyone's problem. You know, we have food insecurity here. We've got food insecurity right on our doorsteps, um, you know, and uh, food insecurity is as much of a problem in Canada and the US and, and Europe as it is anywhere else. Um, and I think people need to remember that <laughs> as well. So when we talk about food security issues, we're talking about here as well as elsewhere as well. Ashley, what about you? Yeah. Um, you know, as you said, food insecurity is, is just as a, a maybe not as severe, but it is still incredibly prevalent here. Um, of the 10 provinces, Nova Scotia has the highest rate of food insecurity. And a lot of that is within our already disenfranchised or vulnerable populations, particularly school-aged children, um, which we saw it increase significantly during the COVID shutdowns because a lot of those kids relied pretty heavily on their school lunch programs. Um, I did prep a statistic for this question. Uh, so in 1969, um, our, the highest expenditure of our income was on our food. Uh, about 19% of our budget would go towards our food expenses. Uh, but in 2019, 30% uh, of our income was going towards housing. Mm -hmm. So between 1969 and 2019, Housing, which used to be about 15% of our budget, has doubled and our, the expenditure actually decreased. So we're actually spending less proportionally um, where it's about 15% in 2019. So while it seems like food prices are on the rise, they truly are, but it's not at the same rate that everything else is. And, and as Peter said, largely that's due to the wage rates not increasing along with everything else. If, David, if I could just- um, Yes, please. So I'm really enjoying uh, the opportunity that we'll go back and forth with Ashley on this, but um, it's wonderful you pulled that, those data because these, uh, they are a continuation of a multi-generational trajectory. Our grandparents, on average, had to expend a far, far greater proportion of their daily labors to secure nutrition than our parents' generation did or than we did. So we live in this paradoxical space where proportionate to our total um, average incomes in society, food has never been cheaper relative to everything else we spend money on. But at the same time, we have persistent uh, nutritional insecurity issues, um, maybe at a declining scale across our society, but it's still there and it's important. We haven't been able to address that. So, you know, achieving the sustainable the SDG goal by, you know, um, no food insecurity anywhere by 2030, you know, we first have to tackle that in a place like Nova Scotia or not first or second, but we, it has to occur here as well as across those larger swaths of the global human family that are more profoundly and acutely food insecure. Yeah. So um, uh, one more one more question, um, and this this is the big one, um, I suppose, right now, um, and this is the one I think we're all grasping uh, grasping at right now as well. Um, and then we'll um, and then we'll look um, at questions from those people who are online who've joined us this evening, um, but. Uh, how are we going to, so it, so 2050, the projections of our population in 2050 are well over 9 billion people, um, you know, and, so, and some projections are suggesting 10 billion people. Um, you know, um, we're hearing, um, hearing statements like, you know, we have to double our food production in the next 30 years to meet that requirement. Ashley's already said that it's not as easy as that. You know, we, we are wasting a significant amount of food. But the big question is, how are we going to feed that population of nearly 10 billion people in 30 years' time? Who wants to kick that one off? Anybody? That's maybe, the crux. Maybe of I can. <laughs> Go on, Ashley. Yeah, you could have started on that one. Uh, so when I was working on my food waste research, um, I came across a report that said if, if we were able to 
redistribute 25% of the global food that is wasted, we would be able to feed 9 billion people without any problem. So it really isn't a matter of production. It's a matter of distribution of those resources. And we don't have that equitable distribution of resources yet, whether it be because of the many disruptions that we can experience within our food supply chains or um, just production restraints in different regional um, situations. So, you know, that, that question of, oh, we have to boost production. We have to produce production in some areas, but we have to be smarter about production in a lot of other areas. So it definitely is this sort of nuanced multi-layer question that has to be looked at from a, that macro lens as like a, you know, a global initiative that everyone's working towards, mm -hmm. but in a regional micro action-based approach, I think. Okay. Um, Paul. Yeah, that's a great question. It's a question I think that's on everybody's mind and on everybody's lips for trying to find a way of uh, answering this question. I think, um, I mean, we're gonna have to reimagine what a human diet looks like in many ways um, and think about how we can use our resources as efficiently and as effectively as possible to grow uh, delicious and sustainable food. So for me, I think one thing that we'll see a huge shift towards is um, alternative sources of protein. Um, we know that um, current uh, production of protein, uh, especially with ruminant livestock, uh, it, it creates a, a lot of uh, greenhouse gases. I think that uh, ruminant meats and milk uh, will always be part of our diet. There's lots of reasons to eat something besides its environmental uh, impact. There are cultural reasons, there are personal taste reasons, um, but I do think we're going to see a shift towards more plant-based diets because that tends to be have a, a whatever you're looking at, whether it's a kil kilogram of pea protein or a kilogram of um, soybean protein, that tends to have a much lower impact than a lot of the other uh, um, types of protein, especially um, ruminant animals, which uh, emit methane as part of their uh, digestive process. Um, one thing that I'm really interested in from the perspective of uh, an, ent an entomologist is looking at how we can use insects to close some of these loops with, with nutrients and resources. A lot of the food waste that, that Ashley was talking about, whether it's at a processing level, that can be used to feed insects, which then can be a really good source of protein for, for livestock. And in many parts of the world, of course, insects are consumed by humans. So there's all kinds of ways that we can reimagine the way that we're currently using our, our uh, resources to have a, a lighter impact on the earth. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Um, and, you know, we, uh, we are working, there are researchers here working on um, looking at um, uh, additives that we can give to our dairy and our beef cattle particularly um, that will reduce methane production um, because that comes back to the probably one of the first questions and that is, you know, um, how is climate change going to affect, uh, affect food security? But on the other hand, production of food can affect climate change. So it just goes around in a circle. Um, so uh, for sure, Peter. What's your, what's your view on this? Um, a few. Um, but let me just pick up on what you said now, uh, just now, David. You know, room, the challenge with ruminants and climate change is not just a function of methanogenesis, like methane production in the rumen. It's a bigger equation, right? There are a lot of nitrous oxide and there's also CO2. I mean, yes, we can address part of those methane emissions potentially with additives or other technological interventions, but it's a it's a big challenge to meaningfully reduce overall emissions from ruminant production. And I wanted to not just, I wanted to also um, extend where Ashley had gone earlier around losses. Losses are an issue. They're hard to squeeze. And they will also, in reducing them in some instances, also contribute to some of our challenges. So solutions are, are not always impact free. So collecting up on a broad basis, let people's leftover food also has um, impact challenges. But there's one area that we haven't touched on yet, and that's um, the surprising overconsumption 
of some of the most impactful parts of our diet that, um, so protein, on average, North Americans, Western Europeans, Australians, overconsume proteins, not, um, not everybody, but on average, by about 30%. And we don't store excess protein. We metabolize it, store a bit of the result as fat, and we excrete the excess. Now, so right away, even before we're talking about pointing fingers at retailers or processors to address losses, we should be thinking about what we're putting on our plate, not just in, in terms of what Paul raised, the, the choice of protein. So absolutely, there's tremendous gains to be had in terms of substitution of protein sources. But just right-size our protein on the plate could immediately, if we did it across the board routinely, that's a 30% reduction in protein demand in a place like North America. So that reduces the greenhouse gas emissions, it reduces all that, and it actually allows us to back off some of those systems that would have a downward price effect overall. Boy, you've got me thinking now, Peter. Um, so uh, over to uh, um, Gianfranco. Gianfranco? Thank you. Um, I read, a friend of mine gave me a, an article published in October uh, in The Economist that addressed these new technologies that are trying to make food that is less harmful from the point of view of the environment, but also that doesn't involve cruelty to animals and uh, some of these possibilities of obtaining proteins, for example, from insects or, or from other vegetable sources, just peas or, or um, soybeans. And, um, and, and I like the way it structured the argument because when I teach food engineering or food science, I, the point of that I start is, well, a piece of food is essentially a combination of four major ingredients, which is proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates. And those carbohydrates are usually fiber or sugars. And uh, the proteins also, one important part of those proteins, although it's a small part, is the enzymes, because they are not just proteins to build things. They are the proteins that make all kinds of other things. And then you have water which is another very important part of it and how they interact. And there's all these, all these smaller things, vitamins, minerals, etc. So in theory, one could take apart the pieces from the vegetables, let's say, from, from a vegetable origin or a green origin, and then reassemble them to make a patty of beef, which is what these new companies are doing. Uh, and it's, well, let's basically mechanically remake a cow. Mm, patty mm? instead of having to have this this beautiful Holstein sacrifice that well Holsteins are not sacrificed they are milked but let's not milk the Holstein let's make milk from the grass so to speak now all the lipids are essentially produced either by the microalgae in the ocean or by the plants on land and then the microalgae get eaten by the krill and those get eaten by the mehaden and those get eaten by everybody else. And then the fishes end up bringing us those very nice omega-3 oils or the plants make it the palm oil or the uh, olive oil or whatever you like it. And we just rearrange those lipids into triglycerides that we need, but we don't make those, those lipids. We don't photosynthesize unless eventually, like now, maybe a Tesla car will come with an electric roof. We'll have a green patch here. When, when we go out and photosynthesize, I don't know if that day will come. But there is another side of all this, which is uh, the microbiology. And um, we've been preserving food through fermentation since forever, or, or transforming it. And now yeast is also playing a role in this possibility of creating new foods in a sustainable way, even though most of it is genetically modified. And I know a lot of people will frown on that, but it's been safely done for such a long time that the, the risks seem to be small. But that, all that consideration is just to realize that we can produce the sources in much less conventional ways as before, but they're still those same sources that we need, the proteins, the lipids, 
the carbohydrates and the other things that we put in. Now, all those things were produced from the land or the sea before. And over the, I don't know, a million years that human beings have been on the planet, and especially in the recent, I don't know, 10,000 or whatever, we've obtained those things from the soil or we've harvested from the sea. And um, that changed dramatically a few times, for example, when we had mechanization in agriculture. When we have chemical developments that allow us to produce chemical fertilizers instead of buying guano from Chile. When thermodynamics allowed us to have refrigeration chains. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we could transport these enormous quantities of food from one place to another without the food going bad. And um, all these technological developments were still using the food produced by the land. What seems to be necessary now is to begin with these other types of sources, which are coming from sort of technologically advanced Silicon Valley style companies, which tend to cater to those who have a higher income, not to the ones who are poor. And, um, and are kind of starting from the top and have a particular vision. Now, I know that a lot of the people who are behind these industries do believe and probably they, they do it very honestly that they are trying to really solve the hunger problem. Um, however, uh, my concern is that these technological advances have ended up um, giving the control and the power to this um, group. I don't know if we call them the producers or the retailers or whatever. So without the soul that we were talking at the beginning of this conversation, without a consciousness or a, I think some guy named Krishnamurti used to talk about a psychological revolution, which means we need to really think, change the way we think and perceive. All of this will just put us back into another iteration of these advances and these developments and these jumps ahead with still the same poverty, the same conflicts, the same wars. Wars used to be a lot about food uh, years ago. Now they are about oil or about some ideologies or whatever they are. So I think that we, I don't want to lose myself personally. I try to keep that perspective whenever I get into these problems. I, I know a lot of the variables involved, but I don't want it to become just a sort of academic problem where all these parts get to be. For me, it's a very personal, very human. There's a, a, per, a man or a woman or a, a person or whatever who's making a decision now that is going to reduce the availability of food for so many families or so many children. I, there's one other small personal experience that if it's time I can share. I lived in Venezuela in the 1970s when I was in high school. And it was a prosperous country by the standards of Latin America. I had lived in Colombia. It was a bit better actually than Colombia. And uh, that country had enormous possibilities chances, whatever. But it has rife with corruption, like many other countries in South America. 20 years ago or so, it changed its political direction. And uh, by the decision of a bunch of people, uh, eventually now, it, that country is suffering a, type of, a level of hunger, destruction, malnutrition, hard to understand for those who only see that from afar. I have family there. I have friends there. I receive daily WhatsApp messages. Uh, it's not in the news where I get my sources. And uh, it's it's unbelievable. How can in 20 years a place go from a normal average of its region to the worst in the world almost? And it will compete with Haiti probably. So um, when I try to understand this, I cannot see another possibility other than this lack of consciousness in use of the resources available. Uh, many of the other countries in South America, you know, they still kind of going at the same level if we want. Uh, they have the same, much less resources than, let's say, Venezuela and larger populations. So why can't that happen uh, in terms of food security, specifically, if we don't look at the health or other issues, but specifically food security, when people have to go and and, and try to 
I mean, garbage doesn't go anywhere until it's completely devoid of any possible nutritional content, regardless of the state in which it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how can we let that happen to other people like us, like you guys or me? Or how, where is the state of mind that allows us to not see that or not do something about it at the levels of the people, every one of us at the level that we can do it? Yep. Thanks, Gianfranco. Um, yeah, so, and that's, that's a really big question. Um, so, uh, We've got a lot of interest online um, and there are questions coming in. Um, and so what I would like to do is turn um, turn to our audience um, and some of the questions that they've done. Um, and the first one, um, which I know is going to be close to uh, a lot of your hearts um, and you'll have views on, is, um, is uh, from Letitia. And it says, I question that we are producing enough as many current production methods are not sustainable and contribute to climate change, where do the panelists sit on sustainable versus regenerative agriculture? Right, who'd like to start us off on that one? Peter? I was gonna say Paul. Okay, all right, well, we'll go to Paul first, Paul? Sure thing. Okay. Uh, thanks. I, uh, that's an interesting uh, distinction between sustainable versus regenerative, and it's one that I have no trouble wrapping my head around. Um, I know that uh, when we're talking about sustainability, people typically talk about the environmental sustainability, but of course sustainability has a, a more broad interpretation with multiple dimensions, looking at economic and the social uh, sustainability. Um, but when we're talking about regenerative agriculture, I, sort of the way that I think about it is um, when we when we have, uh, let's imagine, a field and we're going to be harvesting some sort of food from that field um, as, a, as a product, um, but ultimately we're looking to uh, improve the actual, uh, uh, improve the health of that land, whether that's restoring soil, whether that's conserving diversity, whether that's um, leaving it in a, in a, in a better spot. Um, and that's a, a really hard thing to do when the whole process of, uh, when you think about agriculture, because you know you have something coming from somewhere, whether that's manure from a, a, a local um, animal operation. But I mean, I think really what is key for this idea of, of building a more resilient and more s sustainable uh, agricultural um, production uh, side of things it really does come down to soil. We live on planet Earth um, and soil stores a huge amount of carbon. It keeps our, ha our, our, the health of soil is absolutely necessary for almost all the food that we eat. Um, we know that uh, in, in the historical past, when societies have depleted their soils, they've, um, they've had a lot of trouble. Uh, and uh, we know that a lot of our practices right now aren't so good for the uh, long-term health of our soils. So yeah, it's absolutely critical that we be thinking not just about the, the year end, but thinking about the long time uh, health of our ecosystems. Uh, and that really is uh, essential if we want to continue to pr produce enough. I mean, yeah, maybe right now we're producing enough, but if we damage our environment to a point where it's unstable, where our soil is, is really unhealthy and poor, then we can't take that as a given because it's, it's absolutely not a given. Thanks, Paul. Peter. The uh, question, if I re recall it, was sustainable versus regenerative. I think Paul was picking up on that point. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but I also recall part of the question uh, being framed around the impacts, the general climate change impacts of food systems that we've already been talking about. It, you know, food is going to be one of the toughest challenges to address climate change in. We can, we have relatively straightforward, but hard and, and often expensive to implement uh, strategies to decarbonize a lot of other sectors. Think electricity, um, transportation, heating. But food will uh, retain a set of emissions um, that are, even if we decarbonize every tractor and every fishing boat on the planet and every processing plant, how we produce food in soils and in water, in coastal waters, will result in nitrous oxide.
dioxide emissions, methane emissions, and some CO2 because we will not be able to reverse the, the movement of carbon from soils into the atmosphere entirely. There's a lot of interest in reversing that, but it's an extremely difficult process to do. And, and so we, ha we absolutely have to pursue these, these options, these alternative management strategies, whether we call them organic or sustainable or regenerative. But we need to be, I think, really clear-eyed when we go down these paths and not just assume that rhetoric trumps reason and fact. Set out hypotheses, test them, and actually then adapt based on that. It does. It will do us no good if we start uh, to engage in whole, like, large-scale practices that don't deliver the change that we expect. And coupled with this is any changes that reduce yield. So the amount of whatever food that we're producing per given area. If that yield is going to be sacrificed, we either have to have a commensurate willingness to reduce demand collectively, or we are going to drive the frontiers of the food system further out. And one of the biggest sources of greenhouse gas emissions across all food right now is at the frontier, because every hectare of Southeast Asian, forest that is converted into palm oil or Brazilian forest or grassland, residual grassland that is converted into cattle and soy is dumping massive quantities of carbon into the atmosphere. So we cannot allow the frontier to accelerate and we need to change practices. So how do we do that? We have to get smart, we have to assess and we need to sacrifice some consumption where it is possible back to the 30% of overeaten protein to allow us to have lower yields if they're necessary. Right. Yeah. Um, we haven't got that much late, longer. Um, time flies when you're having fun and had, this is a great discussion. Um, so I'm going to move on to um, our next question um, from um, Colette. Um, and Colette says, and this, I, I think a lot of people are going to be interested in the answer to this question, because I think, you know, everyone, when we go into the uh, supermarket, we're asking ourselves this kind of question. And if we're not, we should be. And that is, as an average consumer in Nova Scotia, are there specific actions I could take to help address food insecurity and then locally or globally? So what can local consumers in Nova Scotia do um, you know, and I suppose we're talking about behavior, you know, and, um, you know, sort of uh, purchasing um, that can help um, address food insecurity locally and globally. Who would like to start with that one? Raise Peter. the minimum wage. Sorry? Lobby to raise the minimum wage. Minimum wage. Okay. Ashley's nodding. Living oh. wage over yep. minimum wage. Living wage over minimum wage. Okay. Yep. Um, Paul, you put your hand up. Yeah, I was going to say uh, uh, call your local politicians, whether it's a municipal councillor or uh, an MLA or an MP. So many of these decisions happen at a scale beyond us as individuals, and policy is uh, really the, the key to addressing so many of these challenges. Okay. Um, uh, Gia Franco? Oh, Ashley. Yep. Oh, Ashley, I was, go ahead. I was just going to add. Um, the, you know, as an individual, like donating to food banks and those sorts of things are good short term, you know, feel good things to do, but it doesn't help um, in the long term of removing the the barriers and the situations that put people into the the situation that they're going to have to access those food banks. Um, ideally, a food bank strategic plan should be to be going out of business um, and closing their doors in five years so that they don't ever have to write another strategic plan. Um, so as we said, lobbying politicians, pushing for a living wage and, and, and voting in a means that will help support the social systems that are necessary to allow people to pull themselves out of poverty. Thanks, the Ashley. Thing, the only thing I want to add is that it's necessary to be for all the consumers to try to educate yourself on what is in the food that you are buying, 
how is that food being processed or produced? There's a lot of hype and curse and mystery and blames and all kinds of weird things that are more or less invented. Um, and it's not that difficult to find reasonable sources. Then you can make also a lot of decisions in the way you buy your food, you use your food, you recycle, uh, reuse or optimize to reduce waste. It's enormous amount of plastic we see in the packaging of food. It's just hard to get away from it. But now buying without a, a package is super expensive to go there, and that's a luxury item. So uh, there, are, your education will contribute to you doing these choices, cho cho the proper choices or better choices. Um, and we will all help each other. Other than I agree completely that you have to call the MP, the, the councillor, the neighbor, the MLA, everybody you can. Okay. Yeah. So it's um, it's so it's interesting, isn't it? Living wage, you know, lobby to change policy. Um, you know, these are these are all incredible things. Um, one thing I would throw in, um, and it's an interesting educational exercise, is you know for consumers in Nova Scotia or anywhere is, you know, set yourself a goal for one week um, to, um, you know, measure, you know, your shopping, you know, that you're bringing into the house um, in relation to food. Um, and then at the same time during that week, measure the amount of food waste. So weigh it um, and then work out what percentage of your food that you're bringing into the house is actually being wasted. Um, I, I've done it on a number of occasions with my daughters as kind of school projects and university projects. Um, and after each one, we tighten things up and, you know, but, but it's still significant, you know, even when you're trying to do a lot to reduce that food waste, it's significant. So one thing I would say to everybody who's on is, you know, set yourself a goal and, and spend a week, work out how much you're bringing in and then, uh, you know, measure how much waste, food waste is going out as well. Um, and it will back up, it will absolutely back up what Ashley was saying earlier on about, you know, a significant chunk, 40%. Right, so we've got time for one more question, okay? Um, and so we are going to <laughs> loaded ladle. Um, and so this one is food insecurity is a global issue and related to everyone. And I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Uh, what are the panelists' opinions on the influence of globalization of food systems to the food insecurity issue? Peter's got his hand up straight away. Go on, Peter. It may not be popular to hear, but to the extent that trade is a central aspect of globalization, it has been essential to the systematic uh, multi-decadal decline in food insecurity globally. Up until just a couple years ago, we had collectively on the planet, that's why we set that 2030 target for zero food insecurity. We had been on a trajectory to potentially get there. We had been systematically as a global human community been driving down food insecurity for many decades. That is a product in part of globalization. Nova Scotia, the million of us in this terrain, could not survive on the calories and nutrients of this terrain by itself. We are dependent on trade with others. And many other parts of the world are as well. So I don't think it's, so around globalization, I think it has been essential to addressing the challenge that as we have at least historically, at least in terms of the trade that it has helped facilitate. Great points, Peter. Um, any other views? I'm looking to see if anyone else has anything they wish to add. Gianfranco? Yeah, I, I agree with Peter completely. Um, as well, uh, we can still cultivate our locavore uh, vocation, of eat local um, to the extent that is possible um, so that uh, a number of other factors that come with the globalization sometimes, which is excessive transportation, things like that can be reduced. Uh, I, so there is a certain counterbalance to that, but without the globalization, it would be probably impossible to really end that. 
in this uh, food insecurity. Um, at the same time, there is a vulnerability. Uh, how many times have we seen that food that it has to go from point A to point B uh, doesn't get there because there's conflict or there's political uh, interest that it doesn't happen? Um, or in all kinds of situations, situations uh, like emergency relief that a certain country doesn't accept or things like that, right? uh, or, or larger scale, no, we are not going to allow you to send all that amount of grain over there. Um, so the globalization can sometimes also uh, kind of, how do we explain this? You have a reservoir and then it's one side is blocked, maybe through another side it can be fed. So it, it provides that sort of safety network, right? but it means that there is something out there that can be attacked. So it's, yep. not, it's a very complex issue. Of course. <laughs> yeah. So, um... I think we're at time. Um, you know, it's uh, that's uh, the hour has flown by. Um, you know, and I know that we uh, we could talk about this for another hour. Um, you know, and uh, and still keep going. Um, so I, I would like to say thank you to our panel members this evening, um, Ashley McDonald. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, Dr. Peter Tidemers. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Dr. Paul Manning. Uh, thank you to you, Paul, and to uh, Dr. Gianfranco Mazzanti. Thank you, Gianfranco, um, for uh, your insights and uh, what has been an absolutely fantastic discussion this evening. Um, I've certainly learned a lot, and uh, hopefully those uh, people who've joined us online this evening have learned something too, um, and hopefully a little bit more of an inspiration as well. Um, you know, and we'll go away and we'll collectively all do our own little bit to try and help uh, the food security, food insecurity issues and challenges that we're facing locally um, and globally. So thanks to all the viewers who've joined us this evening. Um, stay well and take care. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. Thank you, David. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Bye-bye.